What's up? Welcome to a new episode of Movie Schmovie. This is episode number 280, 280. Uh, my name's Steve. I'm one of the co-hosts, and I'm here with... I'm Ron. And I'm John. And we are Movie Schmovie! <laughs> wow, 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 we wow. are Voltron. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like Captain Planet, you know, whichever one you want to go with. <laughs> right. Throw some real cool, like, whoosh, 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 uh, on the screen. For those that are just listening, you don't know anything I just did, so it's it's great. Um, so yeah, we got a lot to talk about today. There's some news we're gonna throw up front. We're gonna talk about the Undoing, um, and season four of Fargo, and maybe what else, whatever else we've all watched, if anything. I'm sure Ronald's probably got a list of twelve things he's watched. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Never disappoints. Where you find the time, man? I'll never I, know. You know. You know, it's, that is a very funny thing. That's a very commonly asked thing. How I, I run a couple businesses and also work and do and watch as much as I do. Yeah, dedication, dedication. I'm the LeBron James of watching streaming content. Yeah, I don't know what I would be now because I'm basically like barely surviving. <laughs> like finding finding time to watch these shows. I'm like I'm literally. I'm going back to work for a couple of weeks, like to kind of get caught up with some stuff for like a promotion mm. I recently got. And uh, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, man. It's been rough, though, man. Going back to work this this prematurely while still like little man is still like barely three weeks old. It's just like I'm running on. I don't know what I'm running on right now. Coffee. And that's really it. Just coffee. <laughs> uh, so finding watching these movies or these shows, man. I didn't. I didn't get through. I didn't get to finish undoing. So I'll dip out when we get to talking about that a little bit. But I do want to talk about Fargo. And um, you know, before we get to any of that stuff, though, there's a couple. You know, in the world of entertainment, in the world of media, <laughs> anything like that, any 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 other podcast that I'm sure either of you subscribe to or sites that you mm-hmm. follow. This afternoon, this early evening, we're recording this on uh, Thursday, December third. This massive, massive announcement came about. Um, yes. You know, basically Warner Brothers, Warner Media made this incredible announcement that, you know, last podcast or podcast before that, we were talking about this, the the, the then huge announcement of what was happening with Wonder Woman 84 and the idea that they were doing this day and date release on HBO Max here in the States, along with, you know, all of the theaters that were opening here and also internationally. And now, you know, a, a week or whatever, however many days later that was, um, they basically just blew the doors off the the place like they basically just came out and said every movie that we have coming out in 2021 17 major motion pictures um are all basically going to do the same thing these are movies some of them that were supposed to come out this year some of them that have always been on the calendar for next year um but we're talking all of their major releases that they have on their slate for 2021 will be coming out on hbo max the same day as they're intended to come out in theaters and uh here in the states and uh, for and, and then this is the one part I want to discuss with you guys for a window of thirty days. Yeah, while yeah. it's in theaters, um, and then I can I guess read it, the just, t- it, it, it disappears into you know like this little thing until it comes out properly on the service or whatever. But yeah, um, I can read the text from the the um, the announcement. I mean, it's it's short. It's not super long. So each film will be available for a limited time. Do a voice, film. Ronald. Like, like that doesn't sound I, like a very. Yeah, it sounds like voice. you. I want to. My energy is super low. Uh, we'll go eat a candy bar or something. This. Yeah. Each film. Uh, each film. Let me something. Each like that. film will be available for a limited time, and release dates are subject to change. So that's important to know. So like, maybe everything that you're seeing may not be exactly what shows up. So that's strange. So like, we know that it's happening directly for a year so then yeah. let me read the other text uh following the one month hbo max access period domestically each film will leave the platform and continue theatrically in the u.s and international territories with all customary distribution windows applying to the title all films will be available in 4k ultra hd and hdr on hbo max holy wow. shit wow <laughs> wow i think because the idea was like Wonder Woman was the first film that was announced to be in 4K. So I, in general, Netflix is in 4K. A lot of the Hulu original stuff's in 4K, which is a fairly recent thing. I don't know um, if a lot of people know that. But 
all of these films are going to be seen in the version that you will probably see on PVOD, which is insane. It's not like that, you know, the, the quality is being deteriorated for the service. Yeah. And you're going to see a half ass version of it. You're seeing it in a full 4K HDR, ultra HD, depending on which which version you're watching. Right. This is insane. Do you have a list of any of the titles? Do you want to list off? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just I mean, I I saw the list, and I mean, it's basically like, you know, the big ones that stood out to me: things like Dune, things like The Matrix mm. Four, Suicide Squad, you know, um, Conjuring, Malignant. I mean, I don't Space I, Jam Two, Space Jam Two. Um, Tommy I mean, like it, it's it's literally yeah. I mean, it's 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 just wild to think that. I think what gets me the most is not just this monumental announcement and like, you know, there's been like three or four versions of these announcements through this whole pandemic, you know, Universal doing their thing with like the day and dates with PVODs and things like that. Yep. And then the announcement that they came to this agreement with for this 17 day window for PVOD after theatrical and then Wonder Woman's announcements. And now this, it's just like watching the progression of this. And that's all we've been talking about on this podcast this whole time. Is you know which movie will it be? Okay, well it's going to be Wonder Woman. Okay, well and then what does that mean for everything? And and this is what's blowing my mind is that this is the same studio that three months ago was basically refusing to do any kind of thing like this and yes. forcing Tenet into theaters to basically bring back cinema, bring back the theatrical experience. Yes. And I place no judgment on the effort because I understand the importance of it, and I too will never stop going to a movie theater once it's safe to go but i think it's just that pivot that quickly yeah it's got to say something about what they think the industry looks like in 2021 mm -hmm. not only for the theatrical arm of it but also for their production arm like they have to keep making stuff and i think that they are done with the idea of pushing movies back over and over and over again even though there's the yeah. disclaimer that you read ronald i think what this does is that this gives them an opportunity to bring back some sort of idea of commitment to a date. You know, like yeah. there may be a problem with theaters opening and, you know, I think they're trying to be optimistic in terms of what happens here in this country about a vaccine and, you know, the first, second quarter of 2021 for us and what it looks like. But I mean, I just think that 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 much of a pivot that quickly from one of the last blockbusters that they may ever release. And I think it will maybe be one of the last blockbusters they ever released in what was the theatrical model. Cause it's probably forever changed now because whatever Universal's doing on their stuff, like, you know, freaky coming out this week and being in theaters only two weeks ago, you know, that's a whole another kind of crazy change. And yeah. what they're doing is kind of like the flip side of that, where they're saying, it's going to be there the same day for 30 days and then leave and then stay in theater so that theaters are the, still the exclusive place to see it. But I mean, by 30 days, though, what does that mean for a theater? I mean, I, I think the, I, I hear what you're saying, but I think the cool part about it is like I, it's going to do two things. Obviously, it's going to make people rush to HBO Max. People are going to be like, oh, my God, for sure. Wonder Woman's coming, for sure. right? So, so that's one thing. But what it will also do is it'll it'll make the moment feel very important the importance of you getting it for that month or whatever you get it for and then if you miss it go see it in the theater if you want to see it in the theater or go get it pvod i think that's cool because if you miss that window which people will you have a the the, the studio still have the opportunity to recoup it in some way shape or form i mean people always felt weird already felt weird about theaters in general I mean, even before COVID, let's let's be honest. Like that, there there's this split in the way that people view theaters, and I don't think they should go away. But I still think this does give some life to the theater. I know it 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 might seem like people don't give a shit about it, but I think that there's still going to be a population of people that go right. and and just and tenant. So here's the thing: this is something I've been thinking about. This is the last thought about this until you guys could talk about it. But tenant is Warner Brothers Mulan. And uh, whether yeah. they want to, wh yeah. whether they want to, it doesn't matter the way that it came out. It didn't come out the same way that the Mulan did. But Tenet, you know, I've seen Tenet. Attest, we can talk about it yeah. later. I can attest to it that <clears throat> Tenet is their Mulan. It, it, it is an idea that like on paper, 
Christopher Nolan, um, you know, inception like sort of sort of film that looks like a, a mind fuck, right? It comes out and sure, I mean it, it got reasonable ratings. It didn't do well in theaters. That's yeah. period. Period. Yeah. There's no getting away around yeah. it. Yeah. It is the, it is their Mulan. So like, you know, it I, I think it's more about the movie and less about the idea of what the, what's happened in the theaters or what's happened in the PVOD or what's happened in the streaming or it has to be a good film. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess the, the sort of movies that are even this even generate this question are these giant blockbusters, right? Yes. And those movies do live beyond 30 days and a lot of times in the box yeah. office, or at least they, they, they hang around another couple, three weeks beyond what you would expect. So, you know, from, from movies that are gone within a couple weeks. So I, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm, I, I kind of agree with you though, Steve, that once a movie has been available for 30 days, it's hard to imagine who's that person that's going to be like, I got to see that and then making it to the theater, but maybe the same kind of hot mess that's insisting on, uh, gathering in public is like missing yes. a movie by 30 days. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. I just, it seems to me that the sort of person who wants to, I mean, it, even though what they did with Tenet was a flop or at least it, it didn't land like they had hoped at all. Um, at least that model makes sense that like the theatrical release was for the people that just had to see it as soon as they could. And that if you could wait, then we're going to put it out at home and they're still going to be able to get a decent splash out of that movie being available at home, I believe. But it does kind of hobble to, to VOD in the sense that there wasn't a whole lot of buzz about it. The people that saw it weren't raving about it. I, I, I didn't see anyone that said it sucked, but I did see a lot of people that said it was kind of confusing or it kind of left them cold. And it's like, that's just not the hype. I don't think that's the hype they wanted coming out of that movie being this big theatrical, like you said, Steve, this attempt to kind of keep theaters alive. It it didn't seem like it really landed for anybody. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think the idea of just like, I think, I mean, it's it's like a, it's, it's, it's a really delicate balance because I think what they're trying to do and I can, I admire it is that, you know, they really, and they even present it as such in their press release and the way that they're kind of framing this is that, they're not they're not, you know, trying to say we're we're kind of like pivoting away from movie theaters like they're still move. These movies are being made for that platform. Right. Primarily, I guess, you know, or or uh, the blockbusters, at least, are the ones that are making these big splashes in terms of like, wow, I'm going to get this one HBO Max, like in the formats like Ronald discussed. But I think the the thing that really kind of. Drives it home is just the idea that they're trying to approach it from an uh, an idea of like. We want people to find this movie and mm. see the movie however they can see it or however they want to yeah. see it. And like Rana was saying, like these 30 day windows, you know, these monthly subscriptions, you know, you don't have to be good at math to say in a year they have 17 releases. If the odds that you want to see half of those movies, maybe, you know, you're going to have a subscription there for at least half a year if you're going in and out. And if that overlaps, you know, it's even longer than that. But I mean, when you yeah. do the math of it, you know, the idea of of what it costs for HBO Max and, and, you know, what it would cost for a movie ticket, those kind of scales is what really kind of goes against the theater. Um, but it'd be interesting. I'd be interested to see, like, what happens in terms of box office, you know, once we start seeing these movies hit um, after that 30 or thir on that 31st day or whatever it is. Um, because I think in general, with the exception of movies that have really good legs and really good ratios, most movies are dropping to, uh, their, their weekend drops, like by the third week are pretty substantial. So, mm. you know, going past 21, 28 days, there's definitely something in that math that made them do that. Just like there's something in the math of universal agreeing to 17 days, because, if you do the math on a lot of these major releases that are making over, you know, $50 million, they're making that money in those, you know, first two, two and a half weeks of, of release. Yeah. So I don't know. It's kind of like a reverse of what Universal's doing. But I mean, I, I do think that, you know, this 30 day window is intentional for, you know, you can have this if you belong, you belong for, you know, a month. Right. You know, and, you know, watch it however many times you want, whatever. Like that, that's a really great marketing uh angle um for for the platform in general but uh so the movies are still being made for theaters but 
Yeah. It's like if you're yeah. if you're a subscriber, if you're a member of the club, I mean, you know, that's what the the future right now seems to be all about these little separate subscriptions. So the yeah. idea that they would say, yes, it's almost like a premium for for being a member of our club is that you can watch it at home, too. But um, yeah. but this is still a theatrical release like they're not, you know, yeah. they're not going to they're not going to basically limit say like the new bond film when it comes out i mean that's a movie that could could last in theaters they're not going to limit it to four weeks by saying um i mean even though it's still yeah it seems to me that piracy is going to run rampant oh my god movies, yeah and that's yeah, going to be it. that but again i still think maybe the average moviegoer who wants to pay to go see a movie is you know that there, there are probably a, a lot of them that that are not uh you know into the piracy or wouldn't even know where to look for, for right. that sort of thing the um I came across an interesting thread on Twitter after this all came out. Um, actually, he's he's one. C. Robert Cargo. He's a co-writer of like he writes a lot of stuff with uh, Scott Derrickson. He did like Sinister yeah. and the Doctor Strange film. He he was he had an interesting th a thread out there after this all dropped, saying basically just about like theatrical movie going here in the states at least, mm. and the stats that he pulled from this uh, survey was basically saying that. The average American sees five movies a year in a theater and less than one in five, roughly 18 percent, sees 10 or more. And those are all numbers that are pre-COVID. So that right. right there tells you, like, just in terms of theater going, like what it looks like here in the States. But one one of the more interesting things was. Uh, so he did, did two years. So 2018, there were nine hundred ninety three theatrically released films. 434 of those movies made less than $100,000 in theaters. Wow. Only 277 made more than a million. And of those 141 that made more than of those 141 made more than 10 million and only 35 made 100 million. Jesus. So you look at even that model and you see the bulk it's like it's like this it's like it's just like the it's just like you know the distribution of wealth in this country. You know, you you, you think about where the money's really going and of those 993 movies 35 of them really are where the money's made yeah those and, are the ones in, you hear in, about. in a year and those are the ones that yeah you're hearing about that are talked about throughout the year whatever and then you know he has the, the 2019 numbers they're roughly the same you know the, the the numbers go down basically is the point is that you know only 132 made over 10 million and only 30 made over 100 million so you know over the course of one year those that made over a hundred million dollars dropped roughly, you know, 17%, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a really, it's a really interesting take to think about who is actually going to the movies and when they are, what are they seeing? Yeah. Because it's those movies. Cause if you're saying, you know, you know, that, that first comment about, you know, people seeing five movies a year, you know, in, in here in, in the United States, it's like the five that they're going to see in most cases are one of those 30 or 35 that made over a hundred million dollars mm -hmm. though those event films those must-see films the avengers the marvels the star wars is the fast and the furious is the bonds you know the wonder woman's so you know you take those people out of these stats and you say you know you can sit at home and watch this movie for the cost of one ticket to belong to hbo max yes and those numbers for 2021 if you kind of did the comparison of what i just read that is where I feel like we really need to look at it and see like how that changes because I think it's also going to change what movies they make still. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's well, wild. It's wild. It is wild. So think about this. On top of that stuff that's coming out, you have the regular slate of of HBO stuff. Not regular, but extraordinary yeah. Yeah. catalog of HBO original series. The HBO Max movies that are going to be acquired at some point that just just going to drop in between these movies. And then just right now, man. I got to be honest, HBO Max is my favorite platform right now in terms of the series that they're putting out. The Flight Attendant. Um, yeah. Uh, I just started on the detective show, the remake. You were talking about it a couple Perry Mason. Ago. Perry Mason. Perry Mason. Uh, I watched the pilot episode. <clears throat> There's a lot of good stuff. Um, I just watched um, Colin. Colin Quinn just put out a parking lot comedy series that is like very in the now yeah. nine comics they show the green room and everything at behind the scenes it's just no, it's there are cool. things there are things coming out on this platform that i just haven't seen on other things and so this is get hbo max and invest in at&t stock 
Those are two things you need to be doing right now. If you aren't, you are a fool. <laughs> probably, it's probably too late at this point. You think so? I mean, it's, 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 stocks I are like at twenty nine dollars right now. Which one? AT and T. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned the flight attendant. Um, I, I I watched the three episode premiere of that as well. Um, Which thing? And I thought it was pretty interesting. I mean, Me honestly, too, after man. watching The Undoing, I had I I sort of felt like The Undoing ultimately is is sort of like a, a pulpier, soapier show than it was kind of pretending to be. It was pretending to be something a little more high minded, and then when it gets to the end, it really was more. I mean, you know, in a good way, really well done, but kind of a, a trashy, soapy story. And I thought that going from The Undoing to watching The Flight Attendant, I found The Flight Attendant's tone, it was a little bit more honest about about where it sits, like how prestigious it is. It, it was willing to be kind of a, 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 a you know, a, a fast paced sort of pulpy story. And it wasn't sort of aspiring to this kind of grandeur that I don't know that The Undoing quite had, but that, you know, through its production value and its acting and stuff, it sort of had the, when it first started, it had the veneer of something a bit more, a bit more prestigious and high minded than it really was. So I thought The Flight Attendant was like a, a, a more fun version of a sort of, you know, hot mess uh, female protagonist in the middle of a of murder mystery. Um, yeah. But also, I just I think the cast on that is is fun to watch. And it, when you said it, it made me think of another little bit of recent news that I did want to just get your your both of your take on. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, I don't know if you saw where Rosie Perez was talking about possibly reprising her role from uh, Birds of Prey in the in whatever sequel they would do. But she said that one of the things that they would have to change or that she would want them a to address would be the ageist jokes that were made about her character in the oh. other movie. And I, hmm. I didn't see birds of prey. I, it's on my list. I've heard good things about it, but um, you know, just things like calling her grandma and stuff like that. And I don't know that that's maybe the tip of the spear for the idea of ageism in movies, but it did get me to thinking about that. Something we don't really talk about. We talk about a lot of isms yeah. on this show, but ageism is something that, you know, especially perhaps for a, a woman and maybe even especially for a woman of color in this business, um, the idea of being marginalized further by being called grandma or by being deemed as like, now you're old. I could see how that would maybe sting her. I think every actor has to deal with that shifting into a different type of role at a certain point. But it is true that that might be one of those, you know, the last groups you can still say kind of mean things about is is old people. I don't know. I just thought it was a topic we've never really covered. What do you guys think of that? Uh, that idea? <clears throat> I I think it I think she's right. Um, the two so there are two times that I've really really paid attention to this. Um, well three. Um, Tina Fey talked about it on um, on Thirty Rock. It was like a a thing about a bunch of old actresses kind of meeting in, older actresses meeting in one place, and they talked about how limited their roles were. Oh, was that not out. on the Amy Schumer show? I think was Tina Fey was Schumer? Tina Fey was in that sketch. Maybe that's it what was, it was. I'm it was on Amy was. Schumer. Yeah, they okay. were all talking about your, what was it, your last fuckable day or something like yes. that. And it was okay, like her yeah. and Julia Louis Dreyfus and all these great yes, comedians yes, yes. that were there to sort of say, yeah, like you're, you know, you're you're like you're 35, which means you're you're now you're in Hollywood. You're now playing yeah. like <laughs> moms, you know. Um, <clears throat> one that was more direct and more, uh, uh, I'd say, a little more sinister was. Um, uh roast that um she's sarah silverman participated in and every joke was about how old she was mm -hmm. and she went on twitter and kind of was like this devastated me it was like all of these things they could have made fun of my face being weird being, you know like any of these things that the first thing they talk about is my age and it, every comic did it and it it was it was interesting hearing someone who comedy is their their way of exp you know that the way that they deliver their art hearing that it could be devastating in in that section in that segment of art as well um i felt that and i listened to her podcast and she talks about that pretty often like just how every once in a while age will just come up in a weird way um and finally rosie rosie perez who in in the show 
that doesn't come up very much. You know, it, it's you're, you know, sometimes they right. I mean, I, I mentioned that because she is in the flight attendant. The role she was talking yeah. about was in Birds of Prey. So it's yeah, not, it's nothing to do with that. So yeah, but, there's, there's two different but, Rosie Perez threads happening here. Yeah. One is in the flight attendant, which she is a recurring character on, and then yeah. the Birds of Prey, where, where which was where her complaint came from. But yeah, but I do appreciate that in the flight attendant that doesn't like. I think the first thing I noticed was that uh, the main character in Rosie Perez were coworkers, and that didn't come up very often because I feel like that's a running joke in shows that have kind of lighthearted humor. Um, yeah, I, I think that'd be pretty devastating, especially mm -hmm. if, you know, you just want to work. You just want to work. You just want to express yourself. You just want to be the actor. You know, you just want to be the role. And well, it's like DiCaprio's character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He's he's mm -hmm. he, he doesn't want to not get a chance to play that heroic role at the center of the story because that's what he thinks he should be able to do. Um, so, yeah, I, I can imagine that that really would mess with your with your ego if your identity is all wrapped up in it as an actor is, is wrapped up in a certain kind of part that people associate with you. And for Rosie Perez, who started as kind of like, you know, a, a young hottie, to, I can imagine that over the course of your career to be to be now you're the elder statesman, that can be a, a graceful thing or it can feel kind of like they're pushing you out the door, I'm sure. And I will say this. I really enjoyed her performance in The Flight Attendant so far. Um, I, I I know that I in the past I've been sort of a, an anti-Rosie Perez person when it comes to her her acting, but I think the last two or three things I've seen her in, she's been really good, and she hasn't leaned on that kind of cartoonish Rosie Perez <laughs> character that she did, I felt like, so often. Maybe it was just on talk shows. Um, so I would say that, yes, if anyone's tracking the show, just like Ronald warming up to Netflix, I've warmed up to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Rosie <laughs> Perez over the course of this show. Um, yeah. But yeah, Ronald, what do you think of Flight Attendant? I, I think it's really cool. I mean, it takes a trope that I normally hate, which is like people that aren't there talking to the main character um, used in a way that just works really well. I, you know, it's 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 something about the way that, you know, Kaylee, the main character, uh, what's, what's her name in the... Uh, I think her name is Flight Attendant. No, I don't okay, know. Okay, um, well, the I'm main sure. character. I'll, Cassie? Cassie? Okay, so let's say Cassie. Yeah, let's just say it's Cassie. Cassie processing, you know, this horrendous murder that she witnesses that's in the trailer of the show. Uh, she wakes up to a, a dead man, and she's trying to process this mur this murder of this man that happened behind beside her. How did it happen when she's sleeping right beside her? How did all this stuff happen? And then, you know, it's fast paced enough that I feel like she's so good at kind of stammering and flubbering around in a way that doesn't feel <laughs> comical, you know? Yeah. Or that it's, does feel comical, but in this case, but yeah, yeah, like it doesn't reasonable. break the reality of the situation, which no. it is a very heightened show, but you're right. It never goes over into full on cartoonishness or even sitcom -ity. Like I, like I, I personally think, I, I was never really I, I, I caught instances here or there of uh, the Big Bang Theory. So I knew kind of what her her character was, but I never really saw her much on that. But this seems like she's you know, if you thought maybe she could only do that kind of broad uh, sitcom stuff, she's she's doing something more nuanced here. And, you know, the character is a binge drinker. And that is obviously a running theme that becomes less and less. You know, it's kind of for laughs at the beginning, but it's less and less amusing as it goes along because you realize the mysteries in her life have a lot to do with this this kind of bad habit she has. Um, so, I, yeah, I, th I think there's like eight episodes total and we've seen three. So there's a lot of story left to go. Um, but there's enough threads to say that, like, I'm interested in the whodunit, but I'm also interested in the kind of overarching story of, like, what's really going on here? Because there's the answer to the who did it. And then there's the answer of, like, well, why? You know, what what is there's international intrigue going on um which is not the case with uh, the undoing which which was also a whodunit that that wrapped up and steve did not see the last episode of the undoing so we're not going to talk about it specifically but yeah. I, I would like to know ronald what is your general take on how that story went like i already explained i sort of feel like the undoing was a was a fine show but it went in my mind from seeming like oh it's this really deep thing to it really was kind of a a pot boiler um stretched out even you would say and i don't even know if maybe the choice to make this a whodunit was the best choice i heard that the original story is not and they made it into one on the undoing and i i wonder if 
knowing all along what was going on would have made the story more rich because th th they're doing certain things with holding off on showing you yeah. certain details and creating mystery around characters uh, to, to create a whodunit that I don't know if this story was best served by that. What did you think of that aspect and the, and the season overall? I, I agree with that. Um, yeah, there's something to it that feels like, man, this 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 doesn't have to be like this. You could just tell us and ha and have him maneuver through whatever, whatever the the realization is, the the twist. Um, one thing that was really off putting to me, I've never heard so many Europeans trying to do American <laughs> accents. I almost made it a is... list for us to talk about because they each have a different way of not sounding American. I think the prosecutor was not American. Yeah. I think um, yeah. the original defense attorney was yep. really not American, and he was even trying to do kind of a New York kind of thing. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. And then the uh, their their attorney Haley, who did a pretty good job, but still, especially when she was like giving speeches, I certain, loved her. I certain, loved no, her. she was incredible. All these performances were great, um, did, but but the, the accents question? were all over the place. It was as though you were in an alternate. Like this is New York, where no one is actually American. Yes. <laughs> Because the two leads uh, are Nicole Kidman and uh, and Hugh Hugh Grant. So th there was a point where I was like, "What?" Like when you talk about the prosecutor when they were in the diner, he's like, "I drop job from." I'm like, "What is this accent?" What it was is like this? Benny the Cab from Roger Rabbit. <laughs> yeah, um, I loved their lawyer. Um, question: When she kind of flirted with him, was she was she really trying to flirt with him? Was that like a that moment? I, I think kinda... that was her trying to see if he would go for it because if he would then she would she would know a certain something about the risks he would take you know the fact that he was circumspect about that moment told her that okay this is a guy who at least is not a total cad yeah um but yes i did wonder for a second is she really coming on to him but no um but yeah they do make her morally ambiguous and even in the last episode you kind of leave her on a moment of thinking okay her job is not necessarily to do what's right yeah. her job is to yeah. help a client um but um all right, Steve, this is the one sentence I would say about the conclusion to the undoing that is a little bit spoiler. So Steve's going to take out his earbuds and then we will do something like this to say, put them back in. Okay. Um, I think one of the reasons why the whodunit part uh, didn't work as well for me, Ronald, mm. is because ultimately it starts off. It's like, here's a whodunit that starts off with here's an obvious suspect. Mm. And, and yet you think, well, it can't be that simple. And so they spend this whole storyline <laughs> yes. making you think it can't be him or that yeah. it has to be something else. And then about the fourth or fifth episode wraps up with this notion of, you know, maybe it's him after all. And for the yeah. show to sort of be like, maybe the guy you thought it was all along, the best suspect is the guy. You know, it felt a little bit like that was a more boring solution, even though plot wise, it made the most sense. It yeah. was kind of boring when you realize, oh, it is actually him. And in a way, this could have been a much more interesting movie. I think it would have sustained like a two hour length much yeah. more interestingly. And maybe I would have liked it even if we'd known from the beginning um, who, he, who it was, because what really is interesting is the fallout. This story is all about what people do when they when when the possibility of a murderer is introduced. It's not really about who did it. So, yeah, yeah, I was I don't know. That would be my also like also there was a thing that happened. So I was I thought Nicole Kidman was great in it. She she does this thing. I don't know, man. Can, can we bring Steve back in? Are you done? Do you want to address my spoilery thought? Oh, Do you... oh OK. Yes. Yes. It's related to that. It's actually okay. directly right. related to right. that. Nicole Kidman felt from the jump that. She was going to betray him. Yeah. And then the concert and the concerted effort to do what they did at the end didn't make her feel it didn't make her feel right. Like that's another touch. thing. It's just oh like, my god! It's just like oh maybe he's the murderer. Maybe she's not in his corner. Those are things that you knew from the first episode. You know, right? What I mean? I'm okay. And they spent I'm... like the whole show making you be like wondering those things, and then when in that last episode, I like I saw that coming from a mile away that she was she was going to turn on him in that in that way. I didn't know exactly how she would do it. It didn't but feel good. That didn't though. feel that much like a twist. You know? No, it di it didn't. So I, I thought that you were supposed to sympathize with a human. Who was basically a victim of this man's lies, but when she did that, it didn't feel good. It didn't yeah. feel like it felt dirty. It, it felt it's because like, she uh, was not that likable of a character either, mm, and he was mm, playing mm. so much more human of a character in some ways that because, you almost sympathized. I mean, that's the art of the story. Maybe is that you sympathize with him at all, um, and you kind of don't want him to do it. But I also think there's something about Nicole Kidman's acting 
she she has such a still face that so often you're wondering what she's supposed to be oh, conveying man. and other characters yeah. will even say what are you thinking i can't tell what you're thinking and you're looking at her going they're holding a shot of her face for so long i think i'm supposed to know what she's what she's yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but i but often she's don't good, know though. no she is very good she is very but good but I, I i hear what you're saying i hear what you're it's saying it's icy yeah i guess yeah. we could can we, get, can we bring steve back <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so S- Steve we were talking about the idea that Nicole Kidman's face at times was so st- stiff at times I mean and this is it's, obviously it's it- restoration you know surgeries that she's had where we couldn't tell without the, the, the gift of dialogue from somebody else <laughs> what she was emoting and, off, and also there would be scenes, Steve, where a character is saying, what are you thinking? Tell me what you're thinking. And they would like zoom in on her face and it would hold on her face. And you're sitting there going like, yes, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 There's something about, so, yeah, it's, 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 she, she's a, she's a interesting, like she's, she's an amazing actress. I, I really, no, we, we also Nicole said Kidman. that Steve, that we've all. We, we said, but she's good. I mean, there's no yeah. question she, that she's good. There's like a weird, yeah, there's this like thing that just. It's, I don't even know who else that I, I can think of to compare her to uh, of, of her peers, but like, there's just something about her where it is really hard to read her face because of I don't know, like just where she's at in her life and yeah. what decisions she's made. Uh, it looks like there's maybe been some, uh, yes, alterations. I don't know, but I yeah, mean she's go- she, I mean, but she's a gorgeous woman. She's an she's excellent gorgeous. actress, and like. Anything that she's in, I usually watch just, you know, because I really do think she's great. But I do know what you're talking about. There's some of those scenes, some of those close ups and just like there's there's a little bit of ambiguity sometimes in some of those shots where like it could really be it, you could look at it a couple of different ways. And I think I don't know if that's intentional. I, I don't think it would be intentional, but, you know, just look looking at her based on like, you know, a facial expression or a tick or like, you know, something that you can really pick up from some performances that are uh, so unique. But so um, good. Yeah, I don't know. So where I, it, I don't want to go too far into, you know, where I'm at because I'm I, I think I'm actually an episode and a half behind because I tried to catch up before this uh, re- recorded this and I just didn't make it. But I mean, overall, my whole I mean, I definitely really you did mention John before I dipped out that it kind of was a little this was a little more like soapy or pulpy like than I thought it would be, and I I, I do agree with you with that for sure. Like it definitely. It's kind of delved into that in those these last couple episodes that I'm on now, not even being at the final episode yet. But um, I don't know. We'll see. I'll, I'll kind of hold judgment until I see the end of the series. But I mean, I'm definitely liking it so far. I can see why you know, so many people are talking about it. But um, now, is it ageist of us to potentially be talking about an actress's surgery, which we don't know for sure that it's surgery that it's causing I don't know. this? But it seems like the like I hope I, that that's not. I hope I you know I'm thinking it and thinking like, well, gosh, are we? Because I I actually think the only th- reason we're even talking about it is because it affects the performance, the performance. it affects the role, yeah. it affects the character and so yeah. on. But I'm sure that that is you know that's something that when you think about it, there's kind of a gendered side of that. But the flip of that is Hugh Grant is I think I just looked it up. He's only seven years older than Nicole Kidman. Well, well he looks about thirty years older yes. than Nicole yes. Kidman. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and he's great too. Yeah. He's another person who you know like we've I love seen. Him. He's, yeah, he's no. got incredible. He's like he's like in a phase right now. Like he's like yeah. he's just so he's he's really doing some good stuff. Has anybody I, pointed out that they're like both Pat Paddington villains yet? Is yeah, that, yeah. Okay, I just thought that that's, was that's crazy. Aside from the lawyer that you know that their lawyer, he was acting circles around everyone he was in a scene with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By the way, the victim's husband was killing me with the voice he was doing. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. Well, he's got to be like, from Scotland too, or something, he's, right? He's from here. He's a he's a New Yorker. <laughs> okay. I right. looked him up. I thought that he was from another country. Actual I'm like New Yorker. I kept waiting for the last episode to reveal that this is actually like a, <laughs> a, like a like a domed city in Europe yeah. somewhere that they're like there is an impersonation of New York. Um, even the little boy, even uh, what's his name? That he's a great actor as well. Yeah, man, Henry. he was. Oh yeah, he, um, Noah Juke. Is that his Noah name? Noah Jupe. Yeah, yeah. Quiet Place. Yeah. 
quiet really place. Good. That's where he's from. He's one of those actors who really plays a kid very well, like very unassuming kid. And then you see him in interviews and he's this super polished, sophisticated, like and he's got the <laughs> accent and he's like, yes, we had quite a laugh working on this or that. And it's just like, shit, this kid, it's like that kind of, um, uh, what's, I can't believe I'm spacing on her name. Um, she's got the kid's sister, uh, but she's like one of those super self-possessed kid actors. Um, Fanny? Yes, Dakota oh, the Fanning. Fanning kids. Dakota oh. Fanning, right? It's just like Dakota Fanning in that sense of like you. It's there's. It's almost eerie when certain kids are that uh, that yes. together. You know. You know. Uh, you know. I mean, when Tom Holland, when I really started paying a Tom paying attention to Tom Holland, he reminds me of that. There's like yeah. a charisma that he has that is scary that I know he uses for evil. It's, it's like a really yeah. good. That's a really good it's, comparison. Yeah, it's it is. so cr- like he'll go in a room. Like I've seen him do interviews, and he's like charming people behind the camera charming this pe- person it's like yeah i'm I'm being manipulated and i love it <laughs> yeah i saw what he was doing he was also in honey boy um and he was doing the press rounds for was, honey boy really he's yeah he plays shia labeouf's you know like the he he's the shia labeouf character in honey boy oh. uh shia is his father in the movie um but yeah all the press that they did for that like him and shia all the interviews they did with uh the director like they're they're chemistry charisma even just the two of them together in real life was yeah. really uh pretty awesome to watch but he does have you know it does remind me kind of of tom holland like when he was in like the impossible and uh um, um, when he was much younger than that but i mean just like he definitely has that charisma yeah i think he's he's great yeah i love noah jupe and he's been really good in everything i've seen him in so yeah um well he's yeah, got we'll a see. great scene or two in the in the finale but there's one particular scene between him and hugh grant that is, uh, I mean, again, if this had been a movie, if this had been uh, squashed down to a two-hour thriller, which I really think it could have worked great uh, as like an old, an old-fashioned thriller, um, the arc that happens in the last episode would almost have been just the last hour of a two-hour movie. You know what I yeah. mean? And mm. and so it hits, it does hit some good dramatic beats, and there's some great performance stuff. But there's a scene with Hugh Grant and Noah that is some, one of the reasons to have made this thing. I think. Do you know what I'm? talking about ronald that's like yes it just yes, grows yes. in intensity and and you yeah. realize how much that relationship is at the center of this story <clears throat> yeah uh all right well now let's talk about uh another show that just wrapped up we've all seen this one fargo season four just finished up this was uh you know every season of fargo has taken a, a different combination of two or three coen brothers movies to sort of play around with the imagery and the iconography from it and this season sort of took us down the path of uh, um, some elements from a serious man, uh, some elements from um, Miller's, Crossing. Uh, uh, Miller's Crossing very heavily, some elements from True Grit. Even there's a little bit of a nod to that. Uh, there's a bit of an episode that that plays around with imagery that might remind you of the Lady Killers, which is which is an odd uh, an odd one from the Coen's uh, repertoire to to refer to. But yeah, this was a really interesting season. This one's the one that took the longest to get to us. We had the longest break between season three and four of Fargo than out of any of those. And those, there's always been a bit of a lag because they finish up a season with the idea that they just told the story they wanted to tell. And it sounds to me like, as ever, FX leaves the door open, but Noah Hawley, the yeah. show's creator, likes to wait until he has an idea for a story. Um, but yeah, I mean, this season, as always, the casting is off the chain on Fargo. We got um, Jason Schwartzman and Chris Rock at the center of this one. I think it's interesting how they both at times felt almost miscast for their roles because they were playing a different sort of energy in this sort of character than we've seen before. But this idea of this mob family saga um, that goes back and forth, that you know, take starts off with a little bit of a history on this these different families and their relationships and catches us up. You know, it's an epic it's a crime story. It's about family. It's about race in America. Um, man, this was, an, I thought, an incredible season of television uh, with some really wonderful characters. How did you guys feel that uh, season four of Fargo stacked up? Steve? Yeah, you, I'll go. Uh, I'll go. I, I, I don't want to over, over, over cut you. Um, I, I agree. I mean, I think this season was incredible. I, I, it felt like a little, like so the story may have lost its way a little bit in the middle episodes for me. I mean... Like you said last uh, episode, it was like well, this was like a one episode longer than the other seasons, right? Like They've been there was 10, a little more. I think every time yeah. this one was eleven. Yeah. So I mean, maybe there was some stuff that maybe was a little, little extra to me. But I mean, I think in general, 
just the filmmaking, the, you know, I think that Noah Halley really has like a special thing with this series. I think he may not have found, you know, the same level of success with some of the features that he's done. Um, but I do think that this series is a really special one. And every season I've really loved all of them, to be honest with you, in different ways. But I do think the special thing, you know, the, the Coen brother movies that we've talked that you mentioned just now, um, kind of where this is pulling from and the performances. Um, I, I, I think the thing that really kind of stands out this season is just how much the season is based around these gangsters, mobs, you know, family clashes, these battles and things like that. And just in the end, um, you know, how minuscule uh, all that matters to characters that kind of make it out alive. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, you know, characters matter to one another and family matters to one another. But all this build up and all these massive set pieces and, you know, really great shootouts and, you know, really stylized uh, standalone episodes like that kind of pull in like, ep like pieces of like the Wizard of Oz and just yeah. really high concept um, storytelling going on. But in the end, like really, you know, we kind of we kind of meet our future of this season, you know, in the first episode of the season, you know, like mm -hmm. like we kind of meet the end in the beginning. And I, I love I love that concept of like and, and even where gangster and, you know, vi mob violence, like where it plays in history, the impact is there and it and the ripples are felt for generations to come. But it's like the generations coming out of this um, are the ones that either make it different or, you know, kind of keep it going. And, and where the season goes, we kind of see we're, we're, we kind of go off with characters that kind of have an opportunity to do both of those things. And I don't know, like it just I, I love that idea of, of these really uh, violent, aggressive characters, you know, and in some ways, like kind of how, how some of them meet their demise. Like, it's just, it's so satisfying. And that sounds like morbid, I guess, but like, it's just, it really is the way they come up, you know, you know the, the, the means that they come up with to kind of off these characters in ways that really, um, maybe aren't like completely unseen or not, not forthcoming, but no, but there's a rhythm. Generally they're, very, they're very good at tricking your, your yeah. expectation, even if yeah. it's just in the sense of when's the gun going to go off and who's going to go down when the gun goes off. It's like you, you can feel certain situations coming to a head and you know, okay, these three or four characters are converging on the same place and there's no way that everybody walks out alive, you know, right. but they, they keep you guessing. And, um, I do think when we come back, we'll talk about this in a non-spoilery way, and then we'll get a little spoilery. And of course, with that, talking about characters' fates, it's 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 right there in your face. But I do think that that sh this show plays around with that idea of, and you kind of alluded to this, Steve. But like, who's going to be important to this story? You yeah, start off yeah. on this show with like a dozen name actors in <clears throat> in in recognizable roles, and they all get to make an impression, and some of them are a great impression, like Ben Wishaw, Jack Houston, um, yeah, great Lynn Thurman, uh, uh, amazing character actor in these really memorable roles but you start to see them falling away as the season goes along and you you go okay does that mean that character is unimportant because they died early in the season or does that mean their death's going to have some effect on the story later somebody's loyalty that's been tested by that or whatever so i think that it is it's it does feel like it both has a purpose and doesn't, which is the same thing, which I, I mean, I think is the main trait that this show has carried over from the best Coen Brothers movies is that sort of randomness, that sort of feeling yeah. of like, well, you know, the thing that should happen and that you would want to happen is not going to be the thing that happens in a Coen Brothers movie. <clears throat> but if you think, oh, there, I wish this would have a happy ending, you might get a happy ending, but it won't be the sort of happy ending you expect. I think that that like keeping you off balance as far as as far as who's important, as far as who's heroic, who's who's going to die randomly accidentally versus you know in a in a blaze of glory uh it, it it makes it's a show that makes you nervous for any character that you have the slightest bit of affection for because i think they have a pretty good track record of killing almost everybody <laughs> by the end of the season <laughs> um i okay so of course you know i came in with this like with some some interesting eyes like you know getting some representation on fargo was crazy to me yeah so i i don't know how this I didn't. I didn't know how this would all fit into the Coen Brothers sort of whimsical world of crazy. There's this idea that that's kind of done in American Gods, and this where you know the American dream for Black Americans is a, a very interesting one because so, a lot of the times there's 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 two groups that kind of exist. There are people that want a seat at the table, 
And there's people that don't give a fuck about the seat at the table. And there's a lot of that nuanced conversation throughout this show. Whether people realize it or not, there's a lot of times where, like, you get checked as a Black person in the world. And they say this stuff a lot. Where they're like, that's cool. You have this building, but you're still Black. All right, Mm -hmm. goodbye. That that happens a lot in the show because you hear it a lot as a black person in the world, right? Right. And and for it to be handled in a way that didn't feel like it was like uh, any leaning too heavy on stereotype or bullshit that you see in a lot of like poorly done sh- poorly done shows. It feels like the writers' room had a good amount of people of all race, shapes, and sizes that wanted to make this work. That that could have somebody like. Uh, Jason Schwartzman, who has his little quips and craziness, and it's amazingly sort of multifaceted character that can be big in scenes and small when he's around people that are kind of intimidating him, and then kind of use that as like a, a rope dope and kind of being big again. It's it's this weird thing that you don't see a lot because gangsters yeah. are kind of one sort of note in a lot of movies. So to be afforded the the space for a character like like Jason Schwartzman character or a character like Chris Rock's character to to be to breathe and not feel like anybody is 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 being robbed of screen time is 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 magic. It is magic, man. Like I I can't stress to you how much I fucking love this season. It yeah. it's not it's it's the most imperfectly perfect se- series <laughs> I've seen in a really long time, and it just balances comedy and seriousness and commentary on the American dream and what it means for everybody. And and, yeah. and the idea that like you could still be you may look like somebody that's winning, but in your family you aren't a winner. It's it's very it's all this nuance that just isn't afforded to a lot of people that that, that was kind of fleshed out. So yeah. Man, I I loved it. I yeah. fucking it's great. loved it. Like that, that's a running theme on this show, too, is that the characters that sort of seem like they make it out, they make it to the margin of the story. And then there's that like that roll call in your head you do of like, wait, which characters are still out there? Who still has a vendetta? Who still has a thing they might do? And you realize, oh, OK, yep, I kind of can see where this is going. I see who can I see because every time that a camera holds on someone you, you and maybe even shoots them from behind or something, they have these little ways of telling you, OK, someone's approaching this person, sneaking up on them or the, yeah. you, you start to feel that everyone is marked you know and i think that they do make use of that in this story that it almost feels kind of shakespearean and i know what you mean ronald about wondering how they were going to overlap that with yeah. if not whimsical but like this kind of dark comic tone and i think for that reason i was as the season was wrapping up i thought well this is one of the most sincere they've had sincere moments of like empathy for certain characters over the course of Fargo. And they've always had like maybe one good character at the center of things. I'm thinking of Alison Lohman in season one and mm-hmm. Colin Hanks. I'm thinking of uh, Carrie Coon in season three, uh, Patrick Wilson in, in season two. There's always yeah. like a good character who seems like they're outmatched by the evil in the world, but they also have a little bit of armor around them because this is, they, they you know, this, this is, the idea is not to present you with the darkest possible outcome. But I right. think this season, that soul, that goodness came from the sort of family struggle you see and the sincere addressing of, of the very thing you were talking about, which is that, and it's, you know, like you said, it's illustrated by different characters throughout the season. There's the Italian-Americans see themselves as above the, the African-Americans, uh, but they also know that they are spit upon by by you know mainstream society and so they 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 relate but they but that doesn't engender necessarily any feeling of brotherhood or anything because the racism against the african americans is still so much stronger um and yeah i think chris rock does i mean that's where where the casting of someone like him who you know has a lot to say about that subject um it really did again he and jason schwartzman brought a contemporary quality to their roles that at different moments made me think i don't know if i'm buying this character's energy in this moment but as it went along i realized how much that is an asset as you said ronald these are unusual characters like jason schwartzman starts off seeming like he's going to be like the soft brother in the family and you see that that's not necessarily the case and and chris rock is all hard edges but you see that what he hopes for is you know for his family to succeed um right. So 
uh, yeah, I think in the end, both of those actors, particularly in the finale, the way that their characters kind of wrapped up their stories, I was really impressed by the cumulative effect of what Schwartzman and Chris Rock did uh, with those with those roles. Yeah. <clears throat> Chris Rock had like a string. Like, there's a parallel between the Stringer Bell storyline and Chris Rock storyline. When when Stringer Bell tried to go legit, and he started buying land, and he he just like he got all this stuff, and then. Somebody was like, nah, this isn't, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, this is not what you are not this person. You're not that smart. It's it, you get the rug pulled from under you. Right. It's like he's busting his ass and he thinks he's in with a certain group of people. And then it's like he finds out it's not going to be like that. And Stringer Bell is usually the character who 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 like expresses that tough reality to somebody. So for him to kind of hit the ceiling of what he could accomplish was, yeah, that was a sort of almost like a form of tragedy for that, for that character. And I, I hadn't thought about that, but uh, you're right. Chris Rock's character in this has a certain element of that as, as hard as he works, as legitimate as he might try to go as useful as he might be, he's never going to get past that one hurdle. That is, that is the, the biggest one. What's that? What's that side? What's the side star Wars film that came out with the tall robot, and um rogue one rogue one so imagine if every black story in america is like rogue one you know what's going to happen at the end of it you yeah. if, if if they're not if the if the business isn't here now it was taken from them it was burned down it was destroyed it was taken by somebody that was doing the exact same thing that they were doing mm -hmm. that tried to make it seem like it wasn't that crazy i i'm doing this because i want to make money for my family and then this family's like i want to do it for my family but because they're white they get away with it like uh the 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 kennedys were bootleggers like that that's crazy like they 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 so moonshine that generations before they became got into politics bootleggers moonshine but that's not how it's presented in the end because the victors can tell a story and that is a cool thing that I swear to God I've never seen on a show before. It's a it's it's a nuanced thing that you just don't see very often. And I, and, it, I and it did give there this an extra bit of heft. I, I'm telling you to the to the to this story. I mean, it gave it yeah. this other thing that it was dealing with that you sort of knew. Okay, they're going to have to deal with this sincerely. Here's a show that deals with everything yeah. cynically and sarcastically, and it's nihilistic. But here's the thing: they can't be totally nihilistic about because it's like. It, again, it's we've talked about miserableism almost in, in stories about black people and how it's not refreshing uh, to see the 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 horrors depicted uh, anymore, seeing the hope right. depicted, uh, seeing, you know, I think that's a lot more interesting. Um, so, no, I think I think that's a uh, I, I did want to talk. We've, we've talked about the different performances um, before we go to our spoiler section. Just uh, we we did mention in the past uh, Salvatore Esposito's performance as uh, Gitano Fada. Oh, God. Um, I found that where that character went through the season, I I warmed up a lot to that character because of Me what too. happens with that character. But I did think that was interesting. Here's a character who was playing such a cartoon early on. I wonder if that was deliberately there to sort of make you think things were going to go one way with the family, because that's another one of those little surprises you were talking about, Steve. Yeah. It's like, yeah. well, w what is actually the makeup of this family? He comes in seeming like he's the, just the crazy loose cannon uh, maniac, and he does have that element to him, but there's more going on there. And there, and that therefore that kind of crazy performance, it almost seems like that was a, a, a misdirect that was meant to make us think, that, you know, think he's, so. he's, yeah. he's, he's the, he's the wild card so. here. Yep. Yeah, he's, I think you're the, right. The, the person screaming the most normally isn't the craziest. That's that's something that, you know, he what he he came into the situation. I mean, there was a little backstory where he said that, like, his family didn't accept him. So he came to America yeah. and he's trying to be this this wolf. He's trying to be this like larger than life character. You know, it's funny you say that because I, you know, I had a similar sort of feeling about him. But once he started, once he started talking about his experience and where he came from, I'm like, oh, he, he was putting on an act. He was kind of being this like. I'll kill everybody in here if I yeah. got to, you know. So I love that. I love the character turn. I, I thought that was really cool, man. Anybody else have anything you want to mention before we go into uh, the spoilery side of things, like a favorite character or a favorite uh, aspect that, that wouldn't be too revealing? The senator? <laughs> Dr. Yeah, senator. About Dr. Senator. Yeah. Dr. Senator, man. <laughs> the, the two doctors, Dr. Senator and Dr. Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
every character that spoke, I loved, man. It was weird. I was not expected to like every single character. I really I really but, liked but, um, Ben Winshaw's character, Irish. I really thought his performance was really good. Mm, yeah, Rabbi yeah. Milligan. Yeah, Rabbi right. Milligan. Yeah. So good, man. Not, I mean, I think that's one of the things I loved most about the season was like that first episode where you get that little brief history of the changing of hands of like who rules the crime world in, in this town over, over the decades. And, you know, this 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 uh what do you call it? this tradition of like you know swapping the kids and like you know the way that's used as a means to gain the upper hand yeah if anybody didn't watch the show like the, the premise starts off one of the, the big dramatic hook of this of the st show that just gets things going is that these different crime families have i guess enforced a certain kind of truce by trading one of their sons for the other family's sons and like if they raise if they're raising your kid and you're raising their kid that there's a weird kind of it's similar to what theon was in game of thrones it was like right. there's been a war and now we have basically a hostage that we're sort of treating like part of the family um and the, yeah. the expectation is you're on the other side of this treating my you know, the person we sent over as part of your family. And yes, Rabbi uh, Milligan has the interesting distinction of being traded twice. The first time he gets traded. And again, this is all in the first episode. Um, but I guess we can tell people we're getting into spoilers. We liked Fargo. We think you should watch it, right? Yeah, That's absolutely. What it yeah. Sure. Down to. sure. Please watch. <laughs> All right, folks, this is your warning. If you want to avoid heavy Fargo season four spoilers, jump ahead about 16 minutes to about a minute and 17 into the podcast. So uh, spoilery stuff. Yeah. Rabbi Milligan starts off. Uh, he's traded away in that in that family trade. He um, he then betrays the family that he's been traded to and allows his his actual family in to uh, kill everybody. Then the, his, his this there's another deal to be made and he's traded again. And this time he feels stung by it and he becomes loyal to the Fata family, the Italian family, and he helps them kill the Irish mob that he comes from. Yeah. So where he is in the story, when you think about that, that like he's just such an interesting character for that reason, that he's like yeah. behind enemy lines, but he's like loyal to them, but they don't treat him like part of the family. And he sees the kid. He's like the father figure to Satchel, who turns out to be. I mean, if, if I was thinking about names, I would have picked up on it a lot sooner. But that Rabbi <laughs> Milligan is the guy yep. who uh, was was uh, in basically raising the guy who would become Mike Milligan, Mike Milligan. Uh, Joaquin Woodbine's character from season two. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I started feeling it and we talked about it, Ronald, we, throughout the season. But um, I got goosebumps when when that whole storyline, yeah. not just the, yeah. the ending, but the part where they travel out of town and you see that yeah. they're laying down the track for it more and more. And the way that whole thing went with Ben Wishaw's character and how he got sucked up into a tornado. Um, <laughs> I mean, insane, but beautiful and brilliant. And what a great way to sort of depict this love that these two characters had for each other without it ever getting sappy and without them ever really expressing it that way totally but, yeah. but yeah that there was so much care taken with that storyline throughout the season and the compassion ben wishaw played uh, i don't know if i've seen him play a character like this before i believe that he was cold-blooded i believe that he could he could kill you um, yeah, yeah. But I also believe that he had a sense of well, that's this just isn't right and i'm not gonna let certain things happen Yeah, especially having been there. Yeah you know, twice, yeah. you know, like, so it's, yeah, that, that, that arc I thought was really a standout for me for sure. Um, what else? Um, I, I, I do wish that some of the women had bigger roles like, uh, Chris, Wa Chris Rock's wife in it. Um, she had a couple of good scenes, but you're right. She didn't get yeah, a lot of screen I, time. I, I, once she performed, you know, when she really came to the forefront, I'm like, oh, my God. Like, why didn't I hear from this lady That scene more? at the door is oh. is insane. Yeah. Insane. Um, The nurse. Oh, yeah. Jesse Buckley. We didn't talk about Jessie her Buckley. in the non-spoilery section. She was incredible. She was great at balancing that cartoony tone uh, uh, that this story could demand right from the start. And never, I never had to get used to her performance the way that I did uh, Salvatore no. Esposito's. She was right in there. Um, her walk, I had to get used to. That's it. 
Yeah. <laughs> Once you accept gotta... that she moves that way, though. But like, yeah, what what, what a set of choices she was making. And her relationship yes. with Jason Schwartzman's character was some of some of the funniest stuff in the season. They're just such yeah. like those two. I love the I love the idea of like the kind of nightmare couple, the two people who like they're both the worst. So, of course, they're <laughs> like they're like yeah. bringing out the worst in each other. But in a, in a sense, that was a love story. Like we saw the way they went out together, you know, having them die basically hand in hand, um, you know, was was great, was was a perfect way to send them off, I think. Um, and I love the way that he died still trying to talk his way out of it. And she died <laughs> at, putting on lipstick, kind of knowing, um, you know, we couldn't decide if she was checking her reflection because she wanted to see herself die or if she was just checking her reflection because she's a weirdo. But I like that she said, could you kill me last so I can <laughs> I can watch you kill him? Yeah. <laughs> so crazy um <clears throat> and i i liked you know all the characters kind of had these life or death situations and they were faced with it you know they gotta get cornered and then you see what they do you know they get cornered and then you see what they do and then eventually that 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 runs out and i yeah. think there's something kind of beautiful about that like that's that's life like you you just kind of dodging crazy shit and he can't dodge crazy shit anymore. And then, you know, you got to give in to it. You know, it, it doesn't right. mean death all the time. But for them, you know, the lives that they led kind of let left them in these traps that they had to get themselves out of. These really heart-wrenching threats. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of worked their way out of it. And watching it it's, for each character was magical. It was pretty damn amazing. I think the character's name was Antoon, the kind of... Uh... A Fada family member who's sent out to kill, oh uh, man, to, to kill Satchel, and you see that he's not going to do it right before he gets killed by uh, Rabbi. And Rabbi would never ever stop and even look back to think that he didn't that that the kid wasn't going to die. Right. We we know that in that moment, Rabbi saved the kid's life, quote unquote. But we also know that this guy who seemed like he had a heart was not going to be able to. He was he was starting to put his gun away, you know. So there's this great that is like. <clears throat> I think the idea of Fargo is full of like a character that does something that no one will ever know what really happened. Like there's no way yes. for anyone to look at the end of this story and piece together exactly what happened. You can say, yeah. well, Satchel's alive. So all this was a lie. But when you see that lie get put, put and when Jason Schwartzman tries that lie, when he comes in and says that the kid's dead, that's just so evil, <laughs> but it sets in motion such awful stuff, you know? Um, yeah. And, and I was, that became the big question for me of the season was, is Chris Rock going to live to see um, his son is alive or is he going to destroy everything and, and then see his son? And in fact, they, they had the happier version of that happen for a while. There's this the yeah. son comes back. He seems to be sitting on top of things in the, you know, the war's over. But then very quickly, what you were talking about, Ronald rears its head. And there he is finding out well, we're, 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 we're not. What did the father guy say to him? We're not taking half. We're leaving half. Um, yeah. But also that guy, I, I don't, I didn't catch his name, but the guy who's left in the big chair at the end, at the beginning of the season, you liked him because he was the one who had like a real relationship with Dr. Senator. And throughout the season, yeah. you can see that he's not the loose cannon that uh, Josto is. And he's not the, he's not the insane weirdo that Jatano is. Um, he's, he seems very the tactical, evil, I think. but yeah. he, it's, it reminds me of like, uh, I don't know, Dick Cheney or something like that. Like, okay, you get someone who's like competent at being evil sitting there. They're, they're going to yeah. do a better job of it, you know? Um, yeah. uh, it's kind of, it's kind of scary, but uh, yeah, I, I like, I, I went from going, oh, I'm glad this guy's still standing. I like him to going, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This guy. Yeah. But I mean, that's part of that unfairness that like, of course, so Chris Rock gets to see his family reunited, but in the end you recognize that, okay, the, the system's not going to work his way. And then, there is the Don't question mind. of the total maniac that's out there who blames him for for, uh, you know, ratting her lover out in a sense that like he's responsible directly or indirectly, however you want to phrase it for, I mean, that's, uh, for her lover dying. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think he did it. I yeah. mean, he said they're there. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. the, the events that follow, maybe you do deserve to get poked that the. the the idea of you looking your dad in the face as they pass away is mortifying. And the way Chris Rock played that moment, Ronald, was insane. Insane. It was. Like, it, it, he's even got kind of a strange look on his face when it's over. But the just seeing Chris Rock, this guy who I know and love from all this stuff, seeing him play that moment, 
a guy who like almost made it to some point of happiness and like had it taken away from him in that moment and dying, like you said, looking in his son's eyes. Oh, Jesus, what a moment. Right. And, and beautifully yeah. played and filmed. And that kid who played Satchel was so perfect. He's already kind of gone inside. You know, there's already some part of him that's somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but he also is like a sweet kid. I love that when he got home and he fell asleep on the bed, he had gotten out like some baseball cards before he <laughs> napped. So I was like, that's so sweet. That's so cool. That's so, that's such yeah. a kid. Like, there's still a kid there. Yeah, yeah. he's still a yeah. kid. He's still a kid. And then, and now I'm wondering, are they going to come back to Mike Milligan or is this just, this show's kind of, you know, it's never going to do the obvious thing. Um, but it was an interesting thing that every season has some connection like that. Like every season ends on some beat where you recognize, oh, this is how this is how this anthology show is not fully an anthology show. Um, but yeah, I loved seeing that, that moment of him again at the end. It's it made me think I'd enjoy rewatching uh, season two a lot. Yeah. I want to, I want to rewatch it. Um, yeah. Just great performances all around. Um, yeah. I love how when Jatano kind of started warming up to his brother, I love there's two things I loved. I loved that seeing Jatano get beat, the shit beaten out of him and almost die and then not made him so much more interesting of a character, someone who had so much more soul. And then when he finds out that his brother did that to him, that he's like proud of him because he didn't know his brother had that in him. And he's like, you yeah. did all that just to try to get rid of me. That's so you, know, you lied. You told him his kid was dead. He's like, you, <laughs> I, you know, I, I like this guy. He's he's funny. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was such a great thing. And then after that super heartwarming scene, you know, that he dies in like a, a total Coen Brothers way of like, you've just pulled off a successful hit and then you trip and blow your own brains out. That was insane. Yeah. Uh, but like the way that that has repercussions for Josto is that everyone now is going to go down believing that he, Josto is responsible for his brother's death. Like, why would you not? There's no one there to clean that detail up, you know, that anyone yeah. would believe. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we haven't really talked about Jack Houston's character yet either, but I felt so nervous for that guy. He was, he did such a good job of making you just feel like, that guy should quit this job and get out of town. Like he's in the wrong line of work, you know, like <laughs> he was just so, he was so it's delicate so... and sensitive and, and the OCD was. thing, but you just felt so, but I felt so bad for him at every scene. Like this poor guy Me can't too. handle it. He's, he's not cut out for this. And his dynamic with Timothy Oliphant was, insane. Oh, Timothy Oliphant was hilarious and perfect. Uh, and, and a different show, would be the hero. It's crazy to think that all of these people were in the same series. Yeah. Yes. You know, like it's, it's like everybody we're talking about is like this is all one season of a show. That's the show yeah. itself is a great show. Like you can plug some other names in there. I'm sure that they would still be interesting. But like all these names, like it's just it's just wild, man. Like and everybody had this like distinct thing about them. Like Timothy Oliphant asking you to repeat things he doesn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like it's just like little things like that. The, you know, the OCD, the, you know, Dr. Senator's sort of effect on Chris Rock. And yeah. You know how he, you know, Chris Rock didn't listen to anybody. And then when Dr. Senator would talk to him, it was like this calm came on him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, it, it's like these little quirks about the show that just worked really well. And, man. Even, and even like Zelmar and Swanee's like yeah. their chemistry and their relationship. We didn't really talk yes. about them, but obviously, you know. Well, we did a little bit, but, um, yeah. you know, it's just like the idea of of how like just I guess like one of you were kind of alluding to it earlier is just how much variety there is in this story. And, you know, you know, you know, black, white men, women, adults, children, like there's just lots of things happening in this season of the show. And like it kind of all just kind of me meshes together pretty nicely. And um, I think like. uh the idea that, you know, the, the story, it kind of goes out on, you know, two separate, I guess, flash forwards of, of you know, the youth of the story and like where they're going. Right. That's kind of like the idea of like th th this, th this, this epic of a season is, is, a, is a piece of history of a character like Mike Milligan that we see in season two right. that's followed him and, and how, you know, he, he played a part in that season. But that part he played behind him is this massive story. And that idea is, is really awesome. And I think that that's something that this season's accomplished is like, you know, with that little tease at the end there and, you know, behind every every player in this game or every player in this story or chessboard or whatever, there's like this bat there's this backstory that like is is in some ways more epic than 
than the story yeah. they're in now. You know what I mean? Like that idea is pretty awesome. And I think this show does a great job of kind of exploiting that or kind of blowing that out. And like this season is a great example of that. Well, yeah, remember at great. the end of Mike Milligan's story, he has kind of a Pyrrhic victory too. He sort of right. succeeds, but in the end is given this boring desk job existence that is similar yep. to like Vic Mackey's fate at the end of The Shield, where you feel like this is a kind of death for this character to be stuck yeah. in this environment. Um, uh, but you're right, Steve, like just the idea that there's that much story behind him. It, it's kind of like the way the first and the second season are connected by... Um, Yep. Uh, is it uh, uh, Keith Carradine? Carradine. His character yeah. saying, "Oh, that that was the worst thing that he ever witnessed on the job." And then the next season is going to be that story, you know. And then when we it's get crazy. to that moment, you're like, "Yeah, I guess that that scene qualifies as that," you know. Um, and also, I would say that every season of this show has brought in some kind of fanciful or supernatural element that they just throw in. And this season had that too with uh, the the ghost uh, around the funeral home. Um, and I, th I love the way they do that. And they just say, yeah, there's a ghost in this one. Different people are seeing it, you know? <laughs> yeah. What? It's like the, this, this flying saucer in season two. It's just like, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we have that now. Yeah. I, I I was so thrown off by that. But I mean, I. Yeah. I, <laughs> I have no actually I have no commentary on it. It just was baffling to me. Like, I could not. It's like, okay, I guess it's just that element. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, like, the, and the sure. the first and the third season have more of the element, I think, with um, David Thewlis's character and with Billy Bob Thornton's character. They both, at different times, are kind of alluded to as being almost like the devil, like that they are some agent of some other force, you know, that they mm. are, that they're, and I think, so I think, yeah, they've done that with every season. There's been some element that you just have to accept. Okay, that's the thing that is like, and again, I think that's where the joke, uh, that's what the Coen brothers, that's why they said at the beginning of Fargo, based on a true story, is because they said true crime stories always have like weird turns in them that if you wrote it, you wouldn't believe it or it wouldn't seem like a good turn. Yeah. And they said by saying this is a true story at the beginning of this, they could have that kind of real life randomness to it and people would accept it because it's true. And so you're more rather than being less likely to accept weird shit because it says true if you hear something's a true story, you're more willing to go wherever the story goes. And you're not necessarily applying those expectations and those rhythms I was talking about before to it. You, you yeah. kind of, you're like, well, life doesn't, doesn't have a, a screenwriter, you know? Um, and I think the Coen brothers, again, that's something they do in all their movies, but Fargo, especially there's this element of like, if you were going to tell that story from whole cloth, you, you wouldn't think you would tell it that way where the protagonist shows up like halfway in, uh, and, and that kind of thing. But you know, it's, it's one of the things this television show has always done really beautifully is just create that sense of randomness. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. I'll, good stuff. Go see that show. Yeah. Watch it all. You can watch all four seasons now. Are they all on Hulu? Yep. All on Hulu. So what else, what else, uh, before we get out of here, what else have you guys seen, or have you seen anything else? I know we know Ronald has, but have you, John, caught anything else? I know you mentioned the other HBO Max show earlier, but anything beyond that? I saw a few things. Ronald, you want to just go back and forth, like say something and a few yeah, words, sure. and then we'll go. What, Absolutely. You want to start? Um, yes, yeah, so I saw this documentary called The Donut King about. Um, Let me guess. It's about the Donut King. <laughs> yeah, it's about a man. Uh, from Cambodia that was dirt poor that started uh, a business based on a visit to uh, a donut shop that was open late night in L.A. And he wound up hiring people from Cambodia to work in these different donut shops, just open up donut shops. He was rich. He was the richest man in, in, like, in that area. Uh, he had something like 50 locations. There was more donut shops. There are more donut shops per capita than any other in L.A. than any other place, apparently. And most of them were are, were owned by Cambodian people. Hmm. And it's it's a really good documentary about how this man kind of rose up and fell off because of gambling. It's really weird. And the the, the guy that, that the, the donut king is it's a good story. So. Where'd you say it is? Uh, it is on uh, PVOD, uh, and hopefully it gets picked up on something soon because it's a really good documentary. 
Uh, well, I watched a new horror film called The Dark and the Wicked, which is uh, written and directed by Brian Bertino, who did The Strangers, which if you've listened to this show, you know, that's one of our favorite recent horror films, or at least one of the scariest, uh, uh, you know, kind of classic recent classics. And I realized when I saw this movie was out, I looked and I, I noticed he's had other movies. I've only seen The Strangers. I hadn't seen his other movies. And I was wondering, I wonder if The Strangers is still his best movie. So I watched The Dark and the Wicked and I watched a movie he did called Mockingbird and I watched a movie he did called The Monster. And yes, The Strangers is still his best movie. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen the one. I haven't seen the new one, but yeah, the monster and, and mockingbird. I wasn't a fan of. And the dark and the wicked. It's got a couple moments that are legit, like masterfully done, uh, mm. that show you that style and skill that he showed with some of the shot framings. And I mean, I remember when I saw the strangers, I was comparing him to Carpenter coming out of that because of the what was in the shot. The cinematography yeah. had so much to do with the fear. Um, he's yeah. got a couple moments like that in the dark and the wicked, but it is like monotonous in the extreme. I mean, this is like an argument against that kind of uh, horror movie where nothing happens. I mean, not say that nothing happens, definitely things happen, but the energy is just, it's kind of a flat line. It starts off with this sense of dread and weird shit happening. And it just, it does have an unconventional rhythm, which makes it kind of entertaining. But I, yeah, I was kind of disappointed. I really thought it looked like from the trailer, it looked like it had the opportunity to be something really, really cool, but it's, yeah. It's no threat. The strangers, you know, which is weird. I, I, I want to check up on all those. Like, you know, that's that happened with Ty West. It happened with uh, uh, what's his name? Brad Anderson, who did um, Session Nine. A lot of these people that I think are the new the new person to watch in horror. They 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 tend to spin out pretty quick, maybe after yeah. one movie. So. OK, um, I saw a Malin Ackerman uh, kind of small film called Chick Fight. It stars her and um It's primarily her, uh, but uh, it's a it's a really good really good movie. I, I it's it, you know it's probably not critically acclaimed just because it's dirty and ridiculous and people hate comedies. It seems like <laughs> <laughs> like legitimately hate comedies. Um, but uh, you know her, uh, she just she finds this underground fight club um, and gets trained by Alec Baldwin uh, to become a, a a great fighter in this underground fight club. This chick fight club is what is this. The, is this the one that has Bella Thorne in it? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I I saw it. I saw the trailer. Yeah. It's it's it. a fun movie, man. Like it. You know, if you don't want to think too much and you you know you want to get a couple feels in, you know, it's it's a it's a good funny movie that I okay. really enjoyed. Okay. Um, I saw a movie that's basically like an art film. It's kind of a day in the life of an assistant in Hollywood. It's called The Assistant, and it stars uh, uh, Julia Garner. Is it Julia Garner? Is that her yeah. name? It stars yeah. Julia Garner, uh, and she's incredible in this, and it's written and directed by a woman named Kitty Green, and it basically just very, very uh, fly on the wall, goes through a day at like a studio office, and you see an assistant and all the little sexist microaggressions that she encounters throughout the day and some of the more nefarious kind of Weinstein-y stuff that's happening in the background that she witnesses, but only a small piece of it and the way she tries to deal with it and the characters that are around her. And it really is just like, when I say it's like an art film, because it never breaks from its conceit of it being like a day in the life of this character. You kind of see every moment in a way condensed down, but you also don't see the sort of big dramatic turns that you might expect if you were doing like a traditional drama about this sort of story. Right. So it's all about watching for those. <clears throat> it's all about watching for those little moments and you start to become really attuned to the tone of voice, the kind of condescending way that people talk to her, the way that people talk about the other stuff that's going on. Uh, you know, this, this movie goes a long way to kind of show you how, a lot of stuff gets swept under the rug and how a lot of people, even someone who might want to do the right thing, it doesn't really have a path to do that without jeopardizing right. their career. And again, I think we hear that and we know that, but this movie dramatizes it in, an, in a really visceral way. And I, I repeat, Julia Garner is, I mean, I, I knew she was good from Ozark, but this seeing her do something so different where she's just so captivating and she's basically on screen the whole movie, um, an amazing performance, uh, yeah, The Assistant. It's on cool. Hulu, I think. Uh, okay, that sounds really good. Um, I saw uh, the Walter Goggins, Mel Gibson movie, Fat Man. Um, the, the idea that like uh, Santa Claus is an actual person who gives coal out and has an actual business, and um, 
a kid gets a lump of coal that is a wealthy person and puts a hit out on Santa Claus. <laughs> the hitman is played by Walter Goggins. Man, it's a fun movie. I mean, a lot of people, it, it's you know, it's one of those movies you could just sit down, have some fun, and watch Walter Goggins be evil. And that's also something I love to see. So, Fat Man. Uh, I saw the bizarre comedy, but I thought it was—I thought it was very funny. Greener Grass, uh, written and directed, and co-starring Jocelyn DeBear and Don Luebi. Luebi, uh, Beck Bennett from SNL is also in it. It's—it is—it's just truly bizarre. One of the reviews I saw on the trailer said it's like if Wes Anderson did a Black Mirror episode, um, and I think that's a pretty fair assessment of the tone of this. It's super. All the details of the clothing and the character quirks and everything, it's all very much on display and it's a very controlled universe and it's kind of poking fun at the suburbs. Like, for instance, every character has braces. Everybody in the suburbs has braces. The grownups, <laughs> every, everybody has braces. Um, uh, Mary Holland, I don't know if you know her. She's a comedian, an improviser. She's done some stuff that's like, been, she's been on like Comedy Bang Bang, but she's done a lot of stuff recently and she actually co-wrote and is in that new uh, Clea Duvall movie, um, Happiest Season. She's in oh. this. Um, Beck Bennett's actually really funny. The, the little chubby guy who played the villain in the Ghostbusters reboot, he's in this, and he's he's great. Um, I mean, again, it, it will either be someone's cup of tea or not, but Greener Grass, uh, I think, I, I mean, it's got just some some real surprises in it. I laughed sometimes just at the scenes just don't go the way that you think they're going to, you know, and, and the energy of the characters, the way that they act, it's like surreal and bizarre, but there's a groundedness to it at the same time. Um so yeah, uh, greener grass, funny stuff. I'll check it out. Um, I was gonna say, uh, Disney Plus is you know starting to get their original stuff out. Um, their show Six One Six that is about kind of Marvel's s sort of mini docs about cultural societal things that are happening that are that are very different from what people know about. Marvel and how things came to be um, is an incredible series, man. If you it, you get a lot of feels from it, um, one of the episodes is about uh, women's contributions to comics that we you may not know, and and that's sprinkled throughout the whole thing. But there's specifically an episode about uh, women artists and and story writers and things like that. And it's just yeah, every episode. I found out something that I just did not know that you probably can't research on Wikipedia or something like that beyond if you know the names of some of these artists. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just really good, well done, short documentaries that'll that'll fill your heart with joy. There's people like Paul Shear and uh, Gillian Jacobs, different people coming in to make them that it seems like they were given access to a lot of material and given a certain amount of freedom. I mean, just from what I read, I haven't seen any of it yet, but it seems like they were given a certain amount of freedom in terms of putting together their individual episodes. It's an interesting idea, um, you know, to take something that could just be self-hype for Marvel and Disney and turn it into a little bit, like you said, of a history lesson or something with a point of view. That's an, that's an interesting idea. I haven't haven't seen it, though, like I said. It's good, man. Um, well, I'm going to throw one more thing out there. I saw a movie uh, directed by David Cronenberg's son, Brandon Cronenberg, called Possessor. Uh, this is not the movie that everyone says is a horror movie and you watch it and you go well, what's so horrible about this uh, this is gory and violent and horrible uh from beginning to end and it's bleak and sad but it's really well shot and it's really well acted and uh yeah i i mean I, to say i enjoyed possessor would probably be a strange thing to say but i thought it was intense and extremely well done and i think there was a point about two-thirds into it where i just said I had to hear myself say it out loud because it is such a bizarre, uh, unpleasant movie. I was like, wait, this is good. OK, yeah, this is this is actually good. You know, it's hard sometimes when a movie is designed to make your skin crawl. Uh, but it actually has some interesting stuff going on. And in the end, it is one of the darker stories I've seen, period. Just the, the way that it wraps up. So um, what's her name? Andrea Riseboro. She, she yeah. can now she can now or Ross Rock Roseboro Roxboro. What is it? Is it Riseboro? I think it's Riseboro. Uh, Andrea Riseboro can now, she, she can basically, she, her record is complete. Uh, it was like, what's the word I'm looking for there? She's, she's got a, she has, she has yet to make a movie where she does not make you feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh man. Um, I guess uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about. If I can find the name of it, man. Um, okay, so uh, there's a lot of tenseness and craziness in the world. And I think something that gives me joy is something that a lot of people may or may not know that I love. And that's the mass Singer, man. Um, from week to week, I, I feel like I'm, 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 I'm falling in love with these singers that I didn't know had the range that they had. You know, the costumes are elegant. Yeah. They're, they're cool and crazy. Are they elegant? And, or are they just they're they're crazy? They're gaudy. <laughs> no, some of them are like I mean, like, like they're really I, they, some of them are like truly elegant, man. Like, uh, but they are gaudy and crazy too. <laughs> One of my favorite is the the like little spaceman. Have you seen that little puppet guy? Anyway, it's uh, <laughs> but yeah, man of the uh, man of the moon. Uh, is he here right now, Ronald? Man, <laughs> yeah, man. Of the Do you moon. see him right now? He's he's right there. <laughs> oh, Ronald. Uh, but Mass Singer brings me a lot of joy, man. It's on Hulu. It's just, it's something light that you can pick up. Um, and if you don't look at spoilers or, you know, it's, it's just a fun show to watch. That'll kill some time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 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 cool, cool. I saw you taking notes, Steve. Were you, were you jotting down some of the things just to. Yeah. I'm, I'm adding a couple things to my watch list. I want to watch that Donut King doc. Yeah, I wonder what you're gonna think about that. I, it, it, yeah, I, I actually, I, I actually have the, I have Possessor and uh, the Dark and the Wicked, uh, so I gotta check those out. Okay, yeah, I'll, ch I'll check but, those out as well. Yeah, no, I got, I gotta just find some, I gotta find time to sleep and then time to watch some of this stuff. Yes, I, I think your priorities are correct. Yeah. I mean, you're in daddy duty, man. I get it. Yeah. I get it. This, yeah, dude. I was... I, man, we are. Yeah, this is. This is unprecedented times at the at the Ritter household. It's like, <laughs> I, I don't remember being this tired when we had Sydney. I don't know. I think I think we weren't because we it was our first kid and it was like we had time to tag in and tag out and things like that. But mm -hmm. now number two, it's like there's always a, there's a, there's a, then there's there's not enough time to split between you know. Well, you you, can, you don't split it. You know what I mean? Like it's one. It's it's, it's man on man now. It's not like right. two on one. Yeah. Like no, 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 it's true. Anymore. It's true. It's yeah. a crazy situation like, where you had them out yeah. numbered to now yeah. that you're. It's, it's a match. <laughs> it, it, it's it's we're, we're, we 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 are we are we are in it, man. It's now going it's great though. It, it's it's going great though. I'm just saying, like my my, my I, I don't know that I've ever been this tired in my life. And that oh, was wow. like. And like we used to like do the warp tour, like that's what I always reference, like as being one of the, some of the most tired I've ever been, was when we would do the warp tour and like we'd be on the warp tour all day, and then we would drive to the next city overnight and like never sleep. I was also younger then, so that's probably the problem. I probably didn't sleep as much then as I am now. But man, movies and TV shows, I will find you again soon. I promise. <laughs> we're we're glad to be here growing. to help you help you find your yeah. way with a few recommendations. Yeah. Absolutely. I got. I, I want to check out Happiest Season. I've heard a lot of good things about that. There was another one that came out. I enjoyed that. Odd. I saw that. I saw Happiest Season. Um, I, the, I guess because it came out. Of, it's yeah. really funny. It's good. Funny. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say they really liked it. There was also another movie that came out called Come Come and Play or Come Play. Come Play. Yeah, yeah. I want to check that out too. Um, John Gallagher Jr.'s in that. Um, but yeah, I got all these movies that are just backing up, man. I got. I got to get. I got to get up. Catch up. And now Freaky's coming out, and Manx coming out, and yeah. Tenet soon is coming out, and we'll talk about probably Tenet more once we all see it. But um, we'll have a lot to talk about hopefully in the coming weeks. Usually, you know, in a normal pre-COVID world, this would be the most wonderful time of the year for all these quality prestige films. So you know, we'll see what comes out soon here. But a lot of stuff's dropping soon. So no, I know when I, when talk I was. About. When I was getting together my list of movies I'd seen for this episode, I started listing movies that I hadn't seen that I kind of had noted I wanted to see. And I realized, oh, it's that time of year where I start making this list of movies I want to watch before I make my list for the show, you know, right. and right. I can't believe we're already at that point where this would normally be this, this. This is the time when all the prestige stuff starts rolling out. And it's happening, like you said, a little bit here and a little bit there. But it is a, it, it, this is going to be an interesting year, I, I think, when people look back on it in terms of the movies that came out and made yeah. a made a made a dent. Yeah. But we'll be here, listeners. We'll be here to sort through it and make we sense will. of it for you. We, we will, take our job seriously. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. All right, cool. Well, 
that'll wrap up this episode. Uh, we're at moviespoovie.com, facebook.com slash moviespoovie. And uh, we, 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 have a, we have a couple new URLs. I know the one, the pod.link slash moviespoovie is a cool little landing page that we've started using. Um, I guess, you know, it'd be good to put that out there uh, if you want to kind of see where you can listen to us. It's got the social media links on it. You can even listen to episodes right on that page. Again, that's pod.link slash movie schmovie. Um, and then um, we talked about it last week, but on our YouTube channel, we're going to start putting more videos up there. Um, two episodes ago, I guess it was, we had the uh, interview with the Run Filmmakers, and that video is up there and doing really well for the podcast. So if you haven't watched it yet, uh, please check it out. If you have, thank you, because it's got, at, at the time that we recorded, I think over 9,000 views. I think Ronald said it the, before we started recording, but um, we'll hopefully be putting more of that type of content out here in the coming weeks, months, in the new year. But um, yeah, find us wherever you can. Take a listen, take a take a watch, and uh, let us know what you think. And uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. But uh, if you guys are good, everything's good, we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. Yes. All right, cool. As always, you've made our day. Thanks. Bye.